question goes back quite a few years. I do remember that um, Venerable came actually from India to Sri Lanka after doing a yoga course in the Ananda Ashram, I think so, near Pondicherry, and a qualified yoga teacher, then staying at Venerable Vangisa's uh, temple or meditation center here at Kalupalua Ve, uh, which is uh, a beautiful land with lots of trees right in the middle of the, you know, the capital of Sri Lanka, it's a beautiful place. And I do remember that it was, I think, 1976 that Venerable Vangis uh, passed away. So it's also around that time that we started our association. But what stands out to me in my memory is um, when I visited um, California, remember in 19, um, was it 87, uh, Venerable Rahule was building up the uh, um, Bhavana Society in West Virginia. And it was midwinter and very cold in West Virginia. So he decided to go and stay, I think, with your parents in uh, California, in uh, you know Los Angeles. And then we bumped into each other since I was there for a few days. And then Rahul took me all around the main centers um, those days. Now there are many more, but uh, still were quite a few Buddhist centers, um, both Theravada, Zen, Mahayana, Tibetan, and all in uh, Los Angeles. And then another particular meeting was not only once, I think several times, about 13,000 feet above sea level in Ladakh, where both of us have had uh, association with the Venerable Sangasena, who built up a beautiful meditation center, library, and a beautiful center in the middle of nowhere. And uh, Venerable Rahul used to go to the Himalayas, especially Ladakh, and uh, used to visit and teach also in that place. Once, I think, yes, because there were in 1995, there were three consecutive weeks that you were supposed to uh, teach and that was a little bit too much and you asked me whether I could take over the middle week which I did uh, gladly <laughs> so that's that particular um, memory and then um, when I was spending some time in the uh, Buddhist uh, uh, temple das buddhistische Haus in Frohnau in Berlin um, you happened to be there and I happened to be there and we had a very nice uh, chat there. Then again in Sri Lanka, we also met several times. And I seem to think that uh, uh, Nilambe Meditation Center was also one of the places where you were way back around 1979 when Nilambe was uh, started. And I was also living just opposite at Vegirikande. And uh, Dr. Suman Ratnaik, I think I remember you from your time in uh, in Stockholm also, and maybe even um, north of Stockholm at the university in 1987, when uh, you were living there. Yeah. So, Venerable um, Rahul, it's fantastic to see you so clearly at such a long distance. And um, um, of course, you have, I must say, uh, built up really the um, Bhavana Society Center in West Virginia, but now you prefer your freedom. You're also going to South America and going all over the world. If you would be sort of bogged down in one place, then um, that would be impossible. But without you, that center would not have been developed uh, as it is. Beautiful, very well done, and a great um, yeah, achievement, I would say. And uh, you are now in Maryland. Is it close to Wheaton that you are, or not really? It's about 30 minutes from Wheaton Temple. About oh, 30 minutes from Wheaton. Good. Well, so we are looking, I'm looking forward to your uh, uh, speech and your meditation. Thank you very much, uh, Venerable uh, Olande Ananda Thero. Uh, I uh, would now invite uh, our uh, committee member, Mr. 
Udaya Ganepola to uh, briefly uh, introduce the Bante Yoga Vachara Rahul Tehu. Our most venerable Bante Yoga Vachara Rahul, venerable Mahasanga, distinguished panelists and Dhamma friends. On behalf of our International Dhamma Society, we would like to give our very warm welcome to who we know as Bhante Rahula among the Buddhist fraternity in the US and many other countries who compassionately accepted our invitation to deliver this special Dhamma sermon today. Bhante Rahula, Venerable Bhante Rahula, if I may, before I call upon you to deliver your talk, I would like to give a brief introduction about you for those who are interested to know about you, your time in Sri Lanka and about your work in general, especially touching upon your early priesthood in Sri Lanka that helped you to be who you are today. Friends, Brante Raula is, got his first exposure to Buddhism in 1973 after following a course on introduction to meditation given by a Tibetan monk in Nepal. A year later, Bhante Rahula arrived in Sri Lanka to continue his meditation practice at Kandubodha Vipassana Meditation Center. In May 1975, Bhante Rahula ordinated as a Samanera monk at the Gautama Tapawane in Kalapaluwawa in Sri Lanka and meditated there for one year. During Bhante's stay in Sri Lanka, Bhante had the opportunity to meet the well-known German monk, Venerable Nian Ponika, and another well-known American monk, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, at the Forest Hermitage in Kandy. Bhante has also met the very inspirational Danish monk, late Venerable Nana Deepa at Bundala, and the well-known Sri Lanka Buddhist monks Venerable Narada and Venerable Piyadasi at the famous Vajrarama temple in Colombo. To add to Bhante Rahula's long list of places where Bhante meditated in Sri Lanka, it is worthwhile to mention that Bhante Rahula also meditated in the forest of Dolan Kada and Mihintale. Bhante Rahula left Sri Lanka in 1977 after three years of meditation and returned to Sri Lanka again for the second time in 1980 and stayed in the island for six more years. Bhante Rahula meditated at the seaside kuti at Unavatuna near the Yadhimula Devali, where Bhante had some of his best memories, Bhante says. Bhante Rahula also started teaching meditation in retreats at Nilambe Meditation Center near Galaha in Kandy during this time. Today, Bhante Rahula has his own meditation center in the US, in Maryland, near Washington, DC, teaching and conducting numerous retreats on various aspects of meditation. Bhante Rahula conducts weekly programs over the internet on Sutta study and Dhammapada to give us a deep understanding of the Buddha's teachings. Bhante Rahula is a distinguished Buddhist monk who has written several books and articles on meditation and related topics in Buddhism. He's an authority on meditation and mixing yoga into the practice of meditation, about which you will hear more about during this discussion. With his vast experience, it is indeed a great privilege to have a Bhante Rahula on our program. Bhante Rahula, you may commence your Dhamma talk now, giving the three refuges to us. Tirwam Sarnai. Well, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the committee of uh, the International Dhamma Program for, and uh, especially Mr. Uh, Ganipola for inviting me to give this talk. And uh, so, so to, uh, to thank Venerable Ulandi Ananda, who's a, an old friend and uh, Dhamma uh, teacher to, uh, to give his little uh, experience uh, about our, our meeting together as well. Uh, so uh, I guess uh, you want to start the program by observing the uh, three refuges and taking five precepts. 
So, That's right. Uh, yeah. Okay, though, so people can go ahead and recite the the Namo Tassa three times. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sambhutasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sambhutasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambhutasa Bhutasa Bhundang Sarananga Chami Damang Sarananga Chami Sangang Sarananga Chami Dutiyampi Bhundang Sarananga Chami Yuti Yampi Dhammang Sarananga Chami Yuti Yampi Sangang Sarananga Chami Yuti Yampi Buddhang Sarananga Chami Tati Yampi Dhammang Sarananga Chami Tati Yampi Sangang Sarananga Chami Anati Pata Veramani Sika Padang Samadhyami Adina dana veramani sika padang samadhyami Kame sumichachara veramani sika padang samadhyami Musavada Veramani Sika Padang Samadhyami Sura Mirya Majapamadatana Veramani Sika Padang Samadhyami Okay, friends. So we've just taken the, uh, the refuges and the precepts, and that's one of the foundations for learning to uh, focus one's mind in the understanding of the Dhamma. And uh, in this uh, talk, I was asked to uh, uh, focus on the aspect of developing mindfulness and living in the, in the present moment. And how does that relate to the teachings of the Buddha, the teachings of the Dhamma, and how to actually uh, practice that in the daily life to get the benefits of uh, the Dhamma practice in a practical way. So I think all of you know that uh, the teachings of the Buddha are centered around the Four Noble Truths. The truth of the suffering exists, the cause of suffering, and that suffering can be brought to an end, and then the way to live, think, and meditate that will uh, help bring the suffering to an end. Now, <clears throat> there's a lot of aspects that go into that, but basically, you know, suffering, the roots of suffering are within our mind. And it's also bound up with the, the law of karma and the, uh, the law of uh, sort of our actions and their reactions. And uh, <clears throat> the you know, the Buddha taught the Dhamma as sort of the natural laws of uh, nature or the natural laws, especially that govern the operation of our body and mind in this world. And especially the natural laws that uh, bring about 
uh, suffering and the nature of happiness, what is really uh, the nature of, of happiness and the causes of suffering. Now, the, the main teaching of the Buddha for understanding the Dhamma is the practice of meditation. And meditation uh, includes the aspects of developing mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. Of course, uh, the practice of sila uh, is the sort of the foundation of meditation practice and is also the foundation of relieving suffering. So just the five precepts that we just took now, uh, you know, probably 98% of all the suffering and problems that you find in the world, individually and collectively, stem from people not being able to follow the five precepts. That means they don't have control over their mind. They don't have control over their urges. And they've been caught up and programmed in uh, attachments, aversions, greed, hatred, and delusions. And they don't know how to get out of that. And uh, because of that, their, their negative, unskillful thoughts, speech, and actions come back to haunt them, come back to cause them various levels of, of physical suffering and uh, mental suffering. So the Buddha's teaching addresses all of those aspects. Now, fundamentally, the, the source of the suffering, the Buddha summed up in the two verses of Dhammapada. That all actions are led by the mind. Mind is their master, mind is their maker. If one acts or speaks with an impure mind, then suffering follows. As the foot cartwheel follows the foot of the ox. And in the same way, if one acts or speaks with a pure state of mind, then happiness follows as your shadow follows you around. So right there in those two verses really sums up uh, the, you could say the whole of the, the Buddha's teaching about stating how suffering arises or ceases and, uh, and then the way to uh, overcome them. So basically the causes of all suffering are deep within our own uh, mind. And in another verse, the, the Buddha mentioned that the world, the arising of the world, the ceasing of the world, and the path leading to the ceasing of the world is right here within this five or six foot long body with its feelings, memory, and consciousness. So that goes to show that the mind is the most important uh, thing to our uh, life. It's the source of our existence, really. And, <clears throat> but the problem is, how does a person change their mind? Uh, how do they get control over their mind? Because as we already mentioned, uh, most people, you know, do not have much control over their thoughts and urges and impulses because, uh, you know, they haven't uh, learned how to do it and uh, no one has taught them. And, <clears throat> but how do we reach the mind? Well, the Buddhas uh, gave these, uh, the path of how to reach our mind uh, in the four foundations of mindfulness. So the four foundations of mindfulness are, are the Buddha's, uh, is the Buddha's way of reconnecting uh, with, our, with our mind and learning how to gain a more conscious control over the mind. And so the practice of mindfulness is the first step in developing or being able to start to uh, slow down and observe our uh, actions of body, speech, and mind. Of course, it's hard to observe our mind. That's why the Buddha started with the body. So the first foundation of mindfulness is mindfulness of the body. And the Buddha chose mindfulness of the body for a reason. Uh, because the body is the vehicle or the home for this mind. And the, the mind operates through this body. And so in order to more easily, clearly access 
our mind and consciousness, we have to be grounded and centered uh, in the body, which is also the present moment. So basically the body is always in the present moment. That means it's always just here. It's a sitting, standing, walking, laying down, doing various movements, breathing in, breathing out. All of these bodily functions are occurring within the present moment. Uh, but our mind is what is constantly moving between the past and the future. So our mind is rarely ever in the present moment because it's rarely fully conscious of our body because it's lost in its thoughts or it's obsessed with the future, thinking about the future and the mind is always a step ahead of our body. Uh, and that's the reason why for so many uh, accidents. So, and all problems are problems of the past and future. Try to think of any problem that you might have and you will probably see that it's connected in one way or another with the past or the future. Even just the future of five minutes from now, you know, you're experiencing a pain. So you're thinking, oh, when's this gonna be over? When's this gonna be over? I wanna move, change my posture. So your mind is in the future. It's not clearly, it's not grounded and relaxed in the present uh, moment. And uh, so that's why we, uh, then react in unmindful ways and our mind uh, spins out of control and all kinds of uh, thoughts, uh, greed, hatred and delusion and so on. So therefore, uh, the body is the access point for bringing the mind to back to the present moment because it's only when the mind is grounded in the present moment that we can clearly see our feelings, our thoughts, our urges, uh, and our intentions before we've be become carried away in them. And, because, and before those thoughts, feelings, and intentions have then caused us to perform some uh, actions that then have their results. So learning how to uh, the practice of mindfulness helps you to remember uh, the present moment. Uh, because in the, again, in the present moment, there's no thoughts about the past or future. So therefore, there's no worries, fears, anxieties, greed, hatred, and delusion, because all those things are thoughts about either the past, we're remembering the past, or we're projecting uh, or wanting uh, the future and anxious that we won't get what we want in the future or having fear of uh, something from the past coming back to cause us pain. So therefore, most of all, uh, the suffering that we experience is the mind fluctuating, going back and forth between the, the past and the future. And so, <clears throat> but the present moment is the natural state of our consciousness. Uh, and, you know, the mind is basically it's similar to a ticking pendulum. A clock goes back and forth, tick, tock, tick, tock. So as long as it's going back and forth, time, the time is kept, the time uh, goes on. But when the pendulum stops, what happens? Then event time stops. So our mind is the pendulum going back between past and future. And when it rests in the present moment, then time stops and time is the present, timelessness is the present moment. And it's the natural condition of our consciousness if it's not being activated. You know, the mind at total rest, such as when you're in deep concentration or in a state of awareness. So anyway, uh, I just was saying that to kind of set the, the background for this idea of uh, the present moment awareness. Now, normally, you know, the, we always talk about mindfulness and concentration, but what is the point of mindfulness and concentration? 
where there's many benefits of uh, practicing mindfulness and concentration, but in terms of the advancement of our meditation practice for the, in terms of developing wisdom, it's to bring our mind to the present moment so we can see uh, clearly what is occurring in the present moment. So uh, that's why, you know, the practice of anapanasati is a way that we, uh, you know, the mindfulness of the body starts with the practice of uh, anapanasati. And by doing that, uh, that helps to bring the mind from its involvement in the past and future to the present moment. And so we're aware of breathing in, we're aware of breathing out. And as we can continue that long enough, as you're keeping the mind uh, attentive, then uh, when a thought arises, you can more clearly see it. Oh, I'm thinking now, okay, let, let go of the thought. So you can more easily let go of the thought and keep coming back uh, to the, uh, the present moment or to the breathing. Now the breathing, the point of the breathing after the, going through the breathing process, the Buddha then has you actually feel the body. So the breathing anapanasati helps you to get centered and grounded in the body in the present moment because you're either feeling the a touch of air at the nostrils or you're feeling the expanding and contracting of the breathing of your abdomen, stomach or rib cage and you're using that as an anchor. So the breathing in the body is the anchor to the present moment. And so the breathing gets you into the body or to the uh, surface, the external body. Okay, I'm sitting. Uh, and then you get under the skin, you start being aware of the sensations. And so the, the mindfulness of the sensations, the Vedanu Sati, gets you a deeper, uh, closer to the present uh, moment, to actually feel the various types of sensations that are coming and going uh, through the body and eventually also through the mind. The, uh, the pleasant and painful and, and neutral sensations. So it eats, and then when you're aware, by being grounded in the body, you can more easily see all the various types of uh, unpleasant or painful bodily sensations, as well as uh, there are, when you start to attain jhana, we have pleasant sensations too. We have PT, we have sukha, and there's a lot of other types of uh, pleasant sensations uh, there in the body. And we can see how the mind is pulled toward the aversion to painful feeling. And we can see how the mind is attracted toward uh, the pleasant feeling. And then our mental states, our thoughts are triggered off by the feelings. And so if we're aware of the feelings and, and kind of objectively observing them, we can see the, the thoughts more clearly, like the urge to want to scratch an itch or the uh, urge to speak uh, or any other types of uh, volitions or just the wandering thoughts. And when the mind starts going to the past or future, we can be aware of ah, thinking, thinking, because there's some space created that uh, anchoring the attention to first the physical body, the breathing in the physical body is like the anchor of a ship, right? So if a ship doesn't have an anchor, when the storms come, the ship is blown about in the harbor and it might crash into another ship or it might uh, capsize or get thrown up onto the uh, uh, rocky shore. So the anchor helps to keep it uh, steady. Uh, so the, the connection to our breathing or body is that anchor to the present uh, moment. And it can either be the breathing or it can be just be the body it's, itself. Like when you're going through the 32 body part contemplations or you're contemplating the four elements, the mind is uh, basically there in the present uh, moment. And so when a, a thought arises, uh, it takes some time for the mind to uh, let go of the 
object and then attend to the thought. So the connection to the uh, breathing and body helps hold the mind so that you can see the thought. Oh, I'm starting to think now. Okay. And let go. And it keeps bringing you back to the present moment. So, uh, you know, the main uh, sort of function of the mindfulness uh, helps to de develop concentration for one thing and awareness of the present moment. Now, a lot of people talk about concentration as you, you practice concentration as a separate type of uh, discipline. This so is like, like focusing your mind on one point and holding it there for a long time and attaining jhanas. Now one can do that, but one can also attain concentration through uh, the practice of mindfulness. Because the main thing that blocks concentration are the five hindrances. So you have to be mindful when the hindrance is, is a blocking, taking us away from the meditation object. Because if we're not aware of that, we get lost in the object. So mindfulness is really the most important. Mindfulness leads to concentration. So, but concentration is simply unbroken mindfulness. Uh, and the mindfulness that's unbroken by any of the hindrances. So anyway, uh, by developing the mindfulness, you gain the concentration. And the concentration means the mind is resting in the present moment with its meditation object, with the breathing, with the body, or in advanced stages, it doesn't even have to have an object. It can just be awareness of the present moment itself is the object. So the, the practice of mindfulness leads to, now I wanna talk a little bit about concentration and, and awareness, because when you read the, uh, the suttas, and here talks on meditation, usually they're talking about mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. The word awareness is not mentioned very often amongst sort of meditation teachers. Uh, and, you know, there, there could be some controversy between these terms and uh, between consciousness and awareness. But uh, basically, consciousness is when we're aware of a specific object. And you're conscious of uh, seeing something, smelling, tasting, touching, feeling. You're aware of a thought. So there's this uh, idea of I am aware of uh, something else. Uh, that's normally how we would uh, define the consciousness. But awareness is when the mind is stopped so much discriminating and is more or less uh, resting in the present moment. Things are coming and going, but the mind is no longer thinking about them, no longer reacting about them. And also the sense of I and me is starts to fade away. And this is a very important uh, uh, distinction to understand in the process of meditation, how the ego, the sense of I and the mental activity are directly related. And how desire and the ego are simply two sides of a coin. You can't have desire without the, the ego. That means the sense of I, me, or mine. And you can't have the sense of I, me, or mine without uh, some type of desire. So when you, uh, and, and all those objects of our desire or aversion are connected with the past or future. Uh, because we're wanting objects we don't have, we want them in the future. And we remember objects from the past and we don't want them in the future. And most of our life uh, revolves around that phenomena. It's what I call the pleasure pain syndrome. 90% uh, or 99 probably or more percent of all of our actions or thoughts from the moment we wake in the morning to the moment we go to sleep are connected with this process of a wanting pleasurable feeling in the future and to avoid uh, the painful feelings uh, in the future or struggling with them in the present uh, moment. So, uh, <clears throat> so awareness is when the mind is, is uh, no longer caught up in that struggle and there's more space within the consciousness. 
because the sense of I is something we go on creating moment by moment. It's not some little thing that's inside your consciousness, so to speak. Uh, we go on creating the sense of I, me, and mine each mind moment. It's being recreated because of the force of past habit and because of ignorance. So the learning how to live with awareness means basically, it means the practice of mindfulness. It means you become mindful of what your body is doing. You become mindful of the feelings that are trying to pull your mind. You're mindful of the thoughts also when you start to get lost in them. And uh, your mindfulness of the of the subtle uh, dhammas. So the four foundations of mindfulness, this is the, the, the practice of learning how to eventually bring the mind back to the present moment, which is its natural condition and which is the natural state of happiness. Uh, and, you know, the mind that's resting in its pure, we'd call it the deathless element, that means the present moment awareness you could consider to be an aspect of the deathless awareness. Uh, but the, uh, so, you know, by learning how to tune back at the, you know, underneath all of our active mind is this parallel dimension of the present moment of the now, of the here and now, where the present moment awareness is always basically there just beneath our nose, if we know how to tune into it. Uh, and the whole practice of the four foundations of mindfulness really is about how to let go of the things that block our natural present moment awareness and therefore our state of happiness or the end of suffering. And that's why, you know, in the Buddhist teaching, he talked about, you know, uh, suffering. Suffering, the cause of suffering, the ending of suffering and the way leading to the ending of suffering. He didn't directly mention happiness because he didn't have to. If you're not suffering, then you'd automatically be happy, so to speak. So uh, as, as a Buddhist or a practitioner, you shouldn't be interested in trying to create some kind of happiness by doing something. But what we're doing is removing the causes of suffering. And when you remove the causes of suffering, which are greed, hatred, and delusion, and the delusion means I, me, and mine, the clinging to I, me, and mine, uh, when you remove the, the causes of the suffering, automatically you'll be happy. You don't have to do anything. Like with jhana, if you can practice uh, concentration and uh, stay on your meditation object and attain the first jhana, your body and mind is full with piti and sukha. Uh, and with the succeeding jhanas too, that gets more refined. So it shows you that really that happiness and bliss is already part of the, uh, the consciousness, is the deepest underlying vibration of consciousness is this, uh, is this uh, uh, I call it awareness. I like to use the term awareness uh, because it it's kind of denotes the difference between the consciousness, which is subject object reactive uh, consciousness, or especially the subject object consciousness. Uh, where that sense of I starts fading away and you experience a much more expanded type of uh, awareness. It's not, uh, it's not reactive and not thinking about I, me, and mine. So that's kind of uh, where I'm coming from when I'm talking about this, but, you know, mention about awareness in the present moment. So awareness in the present moment, I kind of, I use a, uh, in a near synonymous uh, uh, way, but of course there's many levels of that. Now, what is the benefits of doing that? Of course, the, the main benefit is eventually attaining uh, the, the stages of the paths and the fruits and uh, the end of suffering, as we know. Uh, but again, it's not easy to do that. And for the, the, the practitioners uh, that are, you know, learning 
wanting to learn meditation nowadays, of course, uh, meditation practice is becoming very popular because people have tried their wits in uh, trying all kinds of medications, uh, psychiatric medications and shock therapies and you know, so many types of uh, uh, things to cure their mind of, uh, or bodies of their problems and uh, medications and so on. But most of them don't work. And actually, there's another interesting footnote that the word meditation in the English language, it's, it's, it has the prefix M-E-D-I. That's the word, you know, meditation. It's spelled M-E-D-I and then T-A-T-I-O-N. But medicine also has the prefix of M-E-D-I. And a mediator also has the prefix of M-E-D-I, like mediation a person who sits between arguing people and resolves their differences. Medicine acts as a bridge between sickness and health. And meditation is the bridge between the past and the future. So when you practice meditation, that means we're bringing the mind to the present moment, our object of concentration, and learning how to keep the mind uh, fixed to that present moment uh, object. So really, uh, when you look at it that way, meditation is about keeping the mind in the middle between the differences, uh, between the extremes, even the Buddha mentioned that in the, uh, the first sermon, you know, the middle path between the extremes. So one extreme is the past, one extreme is the future, one extreme is pleasure, one extreme is pain. One extreme is me, one extreme is you, and we're caught up in those extremes. But when you place the mind in the middle, that means you place it on the breathing, you place it on the body, and then you keep on developing the, 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 uh, the four stages of mindfulness, going deeper and deeper into the consciousness and our thoughts and our urges uh, then we, we learn to let go of all of those negative uh, tendencies. Uh, but, and then finally, the mind gets purified and can rest longer and longer in the present moment without getting drawn out. So now in practical life, you know, normally meditation teachers, they advise people to meditate twice a day, in the morning for 30 minutes or an hour and in the evening for 30 minutes or an hour. You know, people try to do that, but especially lay people with busy lives, they find it uh, not easy to uh, continue that. And, and also the, uh, well, the mindfulness of the body is really the, the, the starting point or the easiest way to keep the connection to the present moment because we always have the body with us you know from the uh, you know from the moment you wake up in the morning the moment you go to sleep the body's not far away you know just you know a quarter of an inch beneath your nose so to speak so all we uh, uh, 50 kilos 100 kilos or more you know it's it's, it's quite heavy right so it's, it's not some fairy tale, you know, it's uh, right in front of your face, but most people's minds are a step ahead of it. So people are walking down the street, not watching what they're doing and they step in a hole and twist their ankle, or they go out in the street and almost get hit by a car or so many other things. So it's because people's minds are a step ahead of their bodies and they're lost in their thoughts and they're focused on, getting rushing, 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 rushing. And that's where they make mistakes. So learning how to remember what your body is doing is not really not that difficult. You know, it's just remember, okay, I'm sitting now. Sitting, sit. Why is it difficult to remember that? Or I'm standing now, I'm standing, standing, standing. Or I'm breathing in now, breathing out now. Now, of course, breathing in and breathing out is a little bit more difficult to 
to pay constant attention to because uh, you know it's not that strong but the body posture itself that's why the body posture was the buddha's second stage of mindfulness going from the breathing to the postures uh you know anybody should remember i'm sitting right now i'm standing right now i'm walking right now it's not rocket science so but the thing is they they're not they never developed a habit our parents never told us to do that and most of the priests in the church or the temples don't tell us to do that or the politicians don't tell us to do that teachers in school don't tell us to do that but that's really our lifeline the, the body is our lifeline to the present moment uh just to feel it you know not just to remember it but to actually feel the sensations that are uh on the on or in the body even the sensations of your clothing rubbing against the outer skin if you can just pay attention to those which is not difficult your mind would be would have that reconnection to the, uh, to the present moment so in the meditation practice that we're going to do uh, shortly i'm going to actually be uh, kind of guiding you through a simple uh, uh, practice of that kind of uh, body breathing uh, awareness again as the to reestablish the natural connection to the present moment look the baby was in the present moment when it's born it spent 9 months in the womb and going from a one cell organism to a multi billion cell organism trillion cell organism in the space of 9 months so a lot of energy going through there and basically that awareness was there in the present moment and when the baby's born its mind is still connected to the body it's in the present moment doesn't have any thoughts of the past or future yet it quickly learns it but still when it's born it has that connection to the body but then gradually it loses it as it starts paying attention to the outside world learning languages and then getting tempted by pleasurable feelings its mind loses that connection to the body so we have to reestablish reconnect uh, our attention to the body is the first stage of mindfulness and learning how to experience uh, what is really present moment awareness uh, and to to observe the difference between ego dominated consciousness and present moment awareness that's really one of the deepest aspects of wisdom and understanding the the, the deepest cause of suffering is that disconnect from the body that disconnect from the present moment and allowing the mind to get lost in the past and the future that's how the whole ball of suffering basically uh, uh you know started and and continues so and also being grounded in the body in the present moment is a healing power too because so much of our problems and sicknesses even mental sicknesses and body sicknesses is the frust the stress the anxiety the worry the fear that the mind keeps on uh generating and regenerating based on our attachments to the past and the future so learning how to uh disengage from that past and present uh tension and to get regrounded in the present moment and just feeling the subtle sensations of the body feeling the blood pulsing through your arteries or feeling the other sense that just the the flow of the present moment that awareness uh it's it's a healing power and uh learning how to just uh, you know disengage the mind and come back and tap into that present moment awareness by feeling the body Uh, it's really not that hard to do it just takes a little training and it's a very wonderful uh it, it has a healing uh properties to it uh, especially the more you can uh, you know continue that. and so i wanted to mention that apart from our you know kind of longer meditation practices that uh, you might be familiar with 
there's a practice what I call the M&M, &M, and it's called a minute uh, of mindfulness or a minute meditation. And it's a specific practice that we do during the day uh, to pause every hour for one minute. That means we stop what we were doing, just sort of freeze in your tracks and bring the attention to the body. And one of the best ways to do that also is by taking a deep, slow breath. So even if you're standing, actually in the standing position is one of the best times to do it. If you're waiting around for something and looking around, just pause and take a deep, slow breath, bring your attention to the body. And just remember standing, standing, or breathing in, standing, breathing out, standing. And just two or three breaths like that uh, will help to relax the, the body and mind and bring it back to a more relaxed, present uh, awareness. And the deep breathing is very beneficial because the, it takes effort to take a deep breath and to hold your breath in the lungs. So that effort is the effort of keeping the mind in the present moment because it's such a strong, powerful, sensation that it just holds the mind in the present. And then when you let out the breath, you feel that relaxing sensation of the out breath. And so simply by doing that, uh, learning how to break that push to the future, what I call the neurotic push to the future. Most people's minds are, you know, engaged in this neurotic push to the future. Uh, and to, to stop and pause and to cut that uh, connection, that rush to the future and bring it to the present moment. Feel the feet grounded to the floor. Or if you're sitting, feel the buttocks pressing the seat. Uh, feel the clothing touching the skin. Any or all of those things are equally useful uh, connections to that present moment. And you basically, you let go of whatever you are worrying about or obsessed with in that previous hour. You learn how to relax and to regain your composure. To, or if you were angry at somebody in the last hour, you can send them thoughts of metta, for example. Uh, wishing that, or if you did something unmindful in the last hour, you can uh, forgive yourself also and send metta to yourself. But we have to learn how to do that more frequently because this is really the, the best way to uh, uh, sort of weaken those comic habits during the daily life. You know, so many people go on retreats and they always ask, how do we, how do we keep our meditation going during the daily life? You know, there's so much pressures. Because they think, oh, I have to, teacher said, I have to now meditate for an hour every morning. I have to meditate for an hour every evening. Wow, they said, well, I can't do that. So for these kind of persons, you give them this eminem. And because anybody can pause for one minute. Uh, because people waste so much time during the day anyway, repeating things that they were rushing around for. Uh, and then wasting time. So anybody can really pause for one minute every hour during the day. And if you can't do that, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, you know, so everybody should be able to do that. Uh, although the m and certainly are not uh, a substitute for longer meditations, but they're a supplement. You know, people take meditation, uh, vitamin supplements, don't they? To supplement their diet with certain vitamins and minerals. So these M&Ms are like a supplement to our daily meditation practice. But if you find yourself not doing longer meditations, then these are even that much more important. So this is how I advise people when they come to retreats: is that uh, you know to really try to to practice these M&Ms. You know, M&Ms, it's a name for those small candies, you know, in America, those small M&M candies. They're small and sweet, right? So these meditator M&Ms are also small and sweet. 
you know, just one minute, but bring your attention back to the present moment. Take a couple of deep, slow breaths. Let go of all that uh, push to the future. And just come to the present moment. Really, it's not that difficult. The difficulty is remembering it. So, you know, they have meditation apps nowadays. Where you can write little notes in different places around your house. To stop, pause, you know, take your m and and uh, learn how to, to do that. Because, you know, we create most of our karma out there in our interactions with our family, with our neighbors, with our colleagues at work, uh, wherever we go. Uh, that's where we create most of our karma, using wrong speech or wrong actions and so on. You create a lot of good karma, maybe sitting quietly in your house and doing meditation, doing puja. Okay, that's okay. But it's out there in the daily life is when we need to have our mindfulness present. It's when you get unexpected news. The doctor calls you and say, oh, that, that uh, test came out uh, positive and you know, start panicking or uh, you, know, you get a call saying uh, some relative got, uh, had a stroke or got hurt in an accident and immediately the mind starts panicking. So that's when we need to have our mindfulness. And to be able to say, okay, this has happened. Don't get excited. You know, just take a deep, slow breath, calm down, and then just mindfully uh, do what you need to do. And that way that will help us to uh, keep from, you know, doing things that then we regret uh, later or just compounding the, the situations. So uh, anyway, uh, this much is what I wanted to uh, share with you because we still want to do a little meditation practice. So I don't know if there's a, a couple of questions. We might be able to uh, take a couple of questions based on uh, anything I was just uh, talking about. Bhante, we will uh, do the meditation and thereafter take the questions. Okay. So... I know that a lot of you have been now uh, sitting down for a time. So I would say, uh, let's uh, for one or two minutes, just stand up, stretch your legs, uh, maybe do some deep uh, breathing before we sit down to start the, the meditation. So you won't have any uh, uh, painful body sensations or, you know, coming to uh, disturb your mind. Okay. So we'll pause for uh, just a couple of minutes and uh, then come back.
Okay, <clears throat> friends, we're back now to uh, start our little meditation session. So, again, you know, meditation happens between the brain and the spinal column, because that's where all the nervous system data and input is coming through our senses uh, that relays to our brain where we become conscious. So, uh, learning how to sit straight is important for uh, staying alert and usually the chin starts drooping down and that causes us to slouch and that induces sleepiness or being lost in your thoughts so that's why attention to the posture is also useful for learning how to try to maintain a straight posture so anyway just try to sit as straight as you can first of all just feel your buttocks and feet Pressing the floor underneath. Just gently close your eyes. Just feel the weight of the body, buttocks and feet pressing the floor. And feel your hands touching together where your hands touch the legs. And relax the shoulders. Just try to feel the natural inward curve of the lower spine. And feel the head balanced on top of the neck. Try to keep the chin lifted up level to the floor. Now kind of just rest your attention behind the eyes and feel the eyes and in the sockets. Feel the eyelids stretched over the eyeballs. Now from that point behind the eyes, just open the awareness a bit to try to feel the outline of the sitting body. Just in a general way, feel the head balanced on top, the shoulders, straight back, the arms, hands, buttocks, legs and feet not concentrating on them, just to kind of an open awareness, just try to feel that sort of silhouette, vague outline of the sitting body, and just mentally remember sitting, sitting, sitting. Now begin some deep, slow breathing. Try to take three seconds to slowly breathe in, expanding your abdomen, rib cage, and upper chest. Hold the air in the lungs for two seconds. And feel a relaxing contraction of the out breath. Try to feel the last bit of air go out of the lungs. And then the next in breath. Try to take several more deep, slow breaths like that, developing this basic mindfulness. Breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Breathing out, sitting here and now. Breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Breathing out, sitting here and now. Breathing in, feeling the whole body. Breathing out, feeling the whole body. And now we're going to count the breaths from one to ten to try to develop a more continuous 
awareness of the breathing. So if you can, try to take some slightly deeper breaths to help stay concentrated. And with the next expanding in breath, mentally count to one. Feel the brief pause. With the contracting out breath, also count to one. The next in breath, two. Out breath, two. In breath, three. Out breath, three. In breath, four. Out breath, four. In breath, five. Out breath, five. In breath six. Out breath six. In breath seven. Out breath. Seven in breath eight out breath eight in breath nine. Out breath nine in breath ten out breath ten now discontinue the counting. Let the breathing return to its uncontrolled, shorter, irregular rhythm, but continue to feel it. And try to feel the four phases of each breath. The expanding in breath, the brief pause, contracting out breath, and the brief Pause. And use these brief mental notes to help stay focused if it helps you. Just breathing in, sitting. Breathing out, sitting. And the brief pauses between the breaths, feel the outline of the sitting posture. Just try to notice how each breath is different. Sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. Sometimes the in breath is longer than the out breath. Or the out breath is longer than the in breath. It's always changing. The 
at the same time, be alert for thoughts trying to take your attention away. You get caught up in thinking, recognize it as thinking, thinking, or lost, lost. Let go of the thoughts, come back to the breathing. Breathing in, sitting. Breathing out, sitting, breath by breath, moment by moment. Just feeling that reconnection to the present moment, awareness. Even while feeling the breathing, you can notice other body sensations coming and going. Your scratchy sensation, touch of clothing on the skin. All of those help keep the mind awake to the present moment. Try to notice more subtler details, sensations in the breathing body. Especially any painful, unpleasant sensations that take your attention. Relaxing around them, just let them arise, come to a peak, diminish, vanish. The body keeps sitting and breathing, sitting and breathing. Contemplating the body in the body, breathing body within the larger sitting body. This breathing body is the natural connection to the underlying present moment awareness. We lose that connection to the breathing body, the present moment. The mind gets easily lost and tossed about in the stormy seas of 
greed, hatred, and deluded thoughts, worry, anxiety, fear. This breathing body is the only thing, reliable thing we have. And the moment you're born to the moment you die, the breathing body is always right there in front of you. Everything else comes and goes. Breathing in, sitting, breathing out, sitting, sensations come and go, perceptions come and go, thoughts and urges come and go. Thoughts of I, me, and mine come and go. Sounds come and go. These are all just the continuous flow of the impermanent world. Through the body and mind. Just underneath all of that change, impermanence, pain, mental chaos, it's the parallel dimension of the now, of present moment awareness, connected to the breathing body. It's inviting you to come home Come back home to the breathing body. Dukkha pata chani dukkha Vaya pata chani vaya Sukha pata 
Sajjata Nisoka Ondu Sabbe Bipani No May the suffering be free from suffering. May the fear struck be free from fear. May the grieving be free from grief. In this may, way may all beings live with mindfulness and wisdom. And thus spoke the Buddha. And now mindfully place your hands at the edge of your knees and take one more deep, slow breath as you breathe in, stretch the head back, arch your lower spine. And lift the head up and on the out breath, press the chin to the top of the chest to stretch the neck vertebra. And lift the chin up level on an in breath. And relax on the out breath. So that's just a nice, uh, slow, mindful way to come out of the meditation. Okay, friends, so uh, now we just uh, I think I have a few minutes left. So I'll turn it back over to. Uh, Mr. Lakshman. Yeah, uh, Bhante, I think uh, there are one or two questions. Uh, I will take it. Sir. Yeah, okay. Uh, this question, uh, there's one question on chat. Dhammika um, uh, wants to know whether he's concentrating on sermons and Buddhist songs mindfully a meditation face well you could call it a kind of meditation if you understand the meaning of what those songs or chants mean not just listening to them and uh, not really understanding contemplating the meaning of it that's why those things should be done slowly the chanting should be done slowly and and knowing the meaning of each word and then that's reinforcing in your mind the sutra maya panya the the Chintamaya Panya, uh, which uh, becomes a basis for our Bhavanamaya Panya uh, later. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a question in the Q&A from Shoba. What is the difference between foundation of mind and that of mental objects? Uh, well, I don't know what you mean by foundation of mind. Uh, you know, the mind is a mental process. Uh, of course, the words mano are used. Uh, basically, it probably refers to consciousness or the, uh, the underlying uh, unconscious mind, but it's difficult to uh, really define those accurately. But anyway, there's consciousness and there's the mental objects. So, uh, Basically, consciousness is just a light that allows us to experience objects. Is that awareness, a light that allows us to experience objects, but it's not part of objects. The, the mental pictures, the sanya, the perceptions, the thoughts, the emotions, the memories, these are the mental accompany the mental objects, but they're not intrinsic to uh, the, the pure mind itself, the deeper unconditioned mind which we might call awareness uh, uh, and so on so that's basically the the difference it's like water and the objects floating in water if you have a cup of dirty water with pieces of algae and dust and stuff floating around in it and a person never saw clear water they might think oh water is like this but when they sit the water the cup on the table for long enough and all those particles in the water settle down and then they see clear water. Now they know the difference. Ah, that's really the, the water. The other things are just the, the objects. So it's similar in our meditation. When we gain samadhi, when we gain the first, second, third, fourth jhana, or we gain awareness, it's like uh, you separate the, 
just the uh, the concentrated awareness itself from all of the activities, uh, objects and activities of the conditioned mind. That's the only way we see can really see the the difference, and then we can really understand what is the cause of suffering by being attached to the objects. People are just attached to the objects. They know nothing about consciousness. They know nothing about awareness. And they're just totally lost in the objects. And that's what objects connected with the past and future and karma. Okay, thank Bhante, you. Bhante, we have a few on the panel. Uh, we have Deepal Surya Rakshi. Deepal, you like to uh, maybe ask any questions or comments you have? Uh, but I'd like to ask a very simple question. How do you know that you are not fallen asleep, but uh, you have reached a level of uh, stillness? Because that stillness is full of everything. That stillness is not a, a sleep or a blank state. That stillness is very vibrant, but it's vibrant with just vibrations that you're not discriminating. It's just uh, like you're standing on a vibrating machine and you just feel the whole body just just vibrating there in the present moment. That is a stillness. The thoughts are not moving. Their awareness mm -hmm. is the stillness. Yeah. Bante, can I, uh, I think Dr. Sumana, you, you have any questions or comments? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm very grateful to Bhante for giving us a Dhamma talk on meditation. And especially I was impressed to hear about taking M and, M and S, M's supplement for daily meditation. And uh, anyway, uh, I don't have a particular question, but my memory goes to uh, 1990, uh, 1980s Bhante when you were traveling all the way from Germany to Denmark to Stockholm, and I was waiting in Stockholm to welcome you there at that time. And I was so impressed when you came by bus, even sitting on the seat, sometimes cross-legged. And when you got down from the bus at that time, I was so impressed that you did not have any uh, tiredness. And I think you are still continuing with your yoga practices and I learned a lot of your yoga teachings at that time uh, during our meditation retreats. And uh, I'm still practicing, thanks to you. Thank you very much indeed for your presence and for your uh, simple way of, uh, you know, down to a teaching of meditation. Thank you very much indeed. You're welcome. Bhante, we have uh, uh, Venerable uh, G.B. Kassapatero from the UK. Uh, Venerable Kassapa, uh, you have any questions or comments you'd like to make? Uh, muted. No, uh, not muted. No, no, it's muted, yeah. yeah. Right, uh, okay. Uh, uh, we have okay. the... Uh, Bande, we have you have to unmute and speak. Yeah, Venerable was speaking. Venerable Kasap, are you there or can you unmute and speak? If you okay, let's uh, give a little time. Uh, uh, we have uh, Mr. Jagat Sumati Pale from the Vice President of the World Federation of Buddhists. Uh, Jagat, you like to make a few comments or questions you have? Actually, I have no. Uh comments, but I'm very much pleased to listen to uh, Bhante's uh, uh, mindfulness program and the meditation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Uh, any of our other members, uh, do you, Lalit is there, then uh, Seneca has gone. Okay. So Bhante, I think uh, we, we are uh, yeah. much Sorry. If, if you don't mind, uh, I just would like to add oh, something oh, sorry. which I forgot to mention about uh, Venerable Yoga Vajra That is the uh, fantastic book that he had written. Somebody said he has written several books, but I think what stands out is the One Night's Shelter, which comes in two different versions, the long version and the short version, the second one. And uh, that has uh, 
for those who are interested uh, in to know what uh, Venerable Yogavachira Rahul is about, uh, it has many, many details. I was surprised how his memory worked and how many details he knew. It's very interesting for other people, I think, to uh, read that book also. One Night's Shelter by Yogavachira Rahul. And it's just been translated into singular. And wow. it's available in a Sarasavi bookshop, I believe. That's what I was told. Sarasavi bookshop. Very good. It's one of the main bookshops there, you know. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I don't know that the title, I couldn't read the Singlese title of the title in English, but uh, but the know, name will be there. By uh, Venerable uh, Kurunagoda Dhamma Loka, I believe. It's just brand new. It's uh, like been only out a couple of weeks or a month. Okay, good. Much uh, much merit to Bante. Uh, we, we are very very thankful for the uh, the uh, Dhammadesana on mindfulness and also to be in the present status. I think that was uh, very very important. Plus also the conduct of the meditation program. So uh, before we. Uh, uh, invite uh, Bhante to give the uh, thanks to our departed and the others. Uh, can I call, uh, can I invite uh, Kamal uh, to uh, maybe to uh, uh, pay merit to uh, Bhante? Good evening. We are very grateful to Venerable Bhante Yoga Chara Raulatero for this wonderful sermon today about mindfulness and how you made it very, very simple for, for busy folks like us to appreciate the value of uh, the noble truths of mindfulness and the M&M, &M, which is, uh, which is uh, quite interesting. And uh, I hope that you will participate participate with us in the future. I also want to thank Venerable Olande and Thero and Venerable Kasapa Thero for joining us with all the committee members and all the Dhamma friends worldwide. Venerable Olande Thero was the first Bante to participate in our Zoom program and we are very much obliged that he's still with us and I hope that we will be able to hear a sermon from him in the not too distant future and we wish him all the good health. And once again, Lakshman, thank you very much for organizing this. We see Dhamma friends and our committee members spanning from Australia, Scandinavia, UK, Sri Lanka, you, and it's very, very nice to know that this already we had over 180 Dhamma friends and I hope we will continue. And thank you once again, Venerable Rahul Thor, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Kamal. Uh, Udayana, you have uh, any final words um, to mention? Uh, no, I just want to briefly mention that it was uh, very useful in the sense that it was we always think oh meditation is so difficult and all that how can i do it how can i get started but uh, bhante rao simplified it it's not that difficult you could do it very simple and it, the difficulty is to know, to remember to do it i think that's the key here so i think if you all remember to do it my name to take that in my name every hour for one minute if that is all you have to remember you always remember to take the candy so just remember this, I think that if you take it seriously, we all can uh, be very, very well benefited from this session. Thank you, Bhante. Thank, thank you, Udina. I think, uh, Venerable Kasapa, I think you are now unmuted. Uh, you, you want to say a few words, uh, Venerable Kasapa? Uh, yes, uh, just very briefly, uh, Professor Watawala. Something went wrong with the technology there, I think. Uh, uh, I had actually been muted uh, uh, in order to avoid disturbance to the venerable's talk, but I tried to uh, fix it, but it didn't work. So uh, yes, uh, much appreciation to uh, Venerable Rahula, um, a very senior monk whom I've never met, I believe, 
uh, but I've heard many, many things about. And I would just like to say uh, that uh, we all greatly appreciate his uh, efforts in striving uh, to develop his meditation and living in all these austere places. Uh, his stay at uh, that Kuti in Gaul, in Unawatuna, is quite a famous story in Sri Lanka. Um, and uh, many people talk about Venerable Rahula and his book that, uh, uh, that uh, Venerable Ananda just mentioned uh, is very well known indeed. So I would like to wish him well uh, in his efforts to further disseminate the teachings, including in places like Brazil, where I have been also, and where his services were very much appreciated. Um, and uh, <clears throat> all over the world as well. Um, so I'm sure that uh, you know many, many, many people are benefiting from his teachings, both uh, having done so in the past, at present, and in time to come. And uh, he is uh, a monk who is actually offering a big, big service in providing these meditation retreats and so on. So that people may actually put this uh, teaching into practice, you see. Uh, our country of, of Sri Lanka is, very, is famous for scholar monks. Uh, you know, it is the palace of Theravada Dhamma, um, you know, and uh, it is well known for such. But the, the uh, Pariyati, Patipati and Pativeda, all three of them are necessary. And one can see that Venerable Rahula is a monk who uh, both has studied the Dharma very well uh, and who practices it and clearly is a monk who um, has able to uh, realize uh, 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 the Buddhist teachings and is now offering this big service. So I wish him uh, long life, good health and uh, further progress on the path towards realization of Nibbana without delay. Much merit to you, Venerable Rahula. Thank you very much, and the same way to all of you. Much uh, merit to uh, Bhante Rahula. But, uh, can I now uh, invite uh, Bhante to give merit to the departed and also to the devas and to all those uh, who participated? Uh, I think I'd rather invite Venerable Olandi Ananda to do that because uh, uh, my uh, Pali and some of those verses may be a little rusty. So uh, I would rather defer to Venerable uh, Olandi Ananda, who I think uh, probably has much more practice than me in, in that regard, if, if he's so. Uh, I was than just that. about to uh, sign off, but then you caught me in time. So I will uh, do this. Uh, Thank you for the compliment about my Pali knowledge, but it's uh, also limited. Anyway. Akasatta chubhummata deva naga mahindika punyangtang anumodita chirang rakkang tuloka sasanang akasatta chubhummata deva naga mahindika punyangtang anumodita chirang rakkang tu desanang Akasatta chubhumata devana gama hindika punyang tang anumodita tirang rakkang tumang parang ti etta batach amhihi sambadang punya sampadang sambi deva anumodan tu samba sampati sindhya etta batach amhihi sambadang punya sampadang Sambi Buddha Anumodan to Samba Sampati Siddhya Etta Vatach Amhi Sambadang Punya Sampadang Sambi Satta Anumodan to Samba Sampati Siddhya Idang me Nati Nang Hotu Sukita Honto Nyatio Idang me Nati Nang Hotu Sukita Honto Nyatio Idang me nyati nang potu sukita on to nyati yo. Much, uh, 
much merit to uh, Venerable Lorante Anand Tero and much merit to uh, Bhante Yoga Ochara Rahula Tero. I think uh, today's program was uh, the first, as I said, on a Sunday and uh, we had uh, a very good uh, attendance and uh, mindfulness is one that uh, everyone is looking forward to and uh, also to be at the present moment i think uh, pante explained detail how one has to maybe be at the present moment so once again uh, pante uh, thank you and much uh, merit and we are uh, indeed uh, pleased that uh, pante uh, who was ordained in sri lanka was able to uh, maybe give us uh, uh, this uh, dhamma desana digitally but we do hope that when uh, all this uh, covid 19 pandemic is over that uh, bante would be able to be physically with us and uh, much merit to bante so just one one, la one last little phrase okay mindfulness a day keeps dukkha away <laughs> Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you. Thank you. That means practicing the M and M's. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, much merit, uh, Bhante, and we are very thankful. Uh, M and M suites are available, so I think we will never forget that. Uh, everyone will remember. It. Thank you, and much merit, Bhante. So we will now uh, close the uh, Dhamma sermon, and once again. Uh, uh, thanks for everyone who has been attending our Venerable Tero, especially uh, uh, our Olande Anand Tero, because uh, he was the first one who delivered Dava Dhamma Desana, uh, and also the second Dhamma Desana was delivered by him. And today uh, I invited him, and he was he graciously accepted because he knows he has spent quite a lot of time with Bhante Yoga Vachara Rahula Tero, and uh, very well known to him. So we are very thankful to him for saying all the uh, good uh, experiences, the good things of the uh, uh, experiences with Venerable uh, Yoga Vachara Rahula Tero. And uh, once again, much merit to uh, Bhante Rahula Tero and uh, to all, all who are present here. Today. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, uh, Udayana. I think uh, you are very, very <laughs> done a great job. Uh, we are very thankful to you, and we will do it. And uh, of course, we will be having another series of uh, events uh, every Sunday. Maybe we will send in the details so that uh, uh, we'll be having the occupation. And also, 22nd would be the poor day. We'll be having the poor one. So Sunday. we will. Uh, Sunday, yeah. yeah. Next Sunday morning we are having, that is uh, Bhante Sujato would be uh, discussing the sutta. Yeah. That's in the morning. Uh, it will be from 10.30 uh, to 12 noon and then uh, repeated uh, on the 8th and the 15th and on the 22nd we have the poya and then maybe the following uh, Sunday, the 5th of uh, August, uh, we will be having the uh, 5th of September, we are, we are having the other program. So, once again, thank you, and we will close up and uh, with Saranai to everyone. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you very much, Professor Bhattabha. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Dr. Sumana. Sumana and Mr. Jagat. Thanks, Jagat. Thank you very much, much everyone. Yeah. Thank thank you. You. Thanks, thank Dr. Sumana. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Udaya. Thank you. Thank you, Lakshman. Thank you. Okay. We will end up now. Okay. Bye.